Let me thank all of you that were a part of our harvest offering off to our best start ever. And I've talked to a lot of people who weren't here last week or who have not given yet but intend to. Uh, and some of you, God is prompting you to do more. I have no doubt we're going to go beyond our goal like we typically do, which is awesome because with the extra monies, we will be able to do things that God has on His radar that are not on our radar yet. So thank you for your generosity. Today, I've prepared a special stand alone teaching that I think is appropriate for the season we are about to enter. So three pastors get together and decide to go fishing. Now question, who pastors the pastor? Where does the pastor go when he needs to talk about something he's struggling with? So they're in the boat. They decide they are going to confess the sin they struggle the most with to each other. So the first pastor says, I have a drinking problem. Uh, I, I can't handle my alcohol. It's hurting me. It's hurting my family and my ministry. I, I can't stop. I need to get help. The second pastor said, if you're going to be that honest, then I'll admit I have a gambling addiction. Uh, it's ruining my finances. It's ruining my marriage. I can't stop. I need some help. And the third pastor said, well, the sin I struggle most with is gossip. And I can't wait to get off this boat. <laughs> so in over 45 years of pastoring, I have heard almost every sin you could imagine be confessed. I've heard sins you can't imagine be confessed. But there's one sin I've never heard confessed, not in over 45 years. And here's the irony. It is the one sin Jesus uniquely said we should be on guard against. Luke 12, then someone called from the crowd, teacher, Please tell my brother to ju divide our father's inherit estate with me. And Jesus replied, friend, who'd made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? And then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. I find it interesting. Jesus never said that we should be on guard against what most people consider to be the big commandments. Like, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie. Instead, he focused on this one commandment that seems inconsequential compared to the others. Because another way to rephrase what Jesus said is from the Revised Version, take heed and beware of all covetousness. Now, you can call it greed, you can call it coveting, uh, I like to call it the more virus. But whatever you call it, it is the one sin everyone confronts and no one confesses. So today I want to talk with you about why this little commandment is such a big deal. Do you remember the giving of the Ten Commandments? The children of Israel have been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years. God redeems them and delivers them through a series of mighty miracles. They're brought out into the desert, taken to a mountain, and God gives them these 10 commandments. Now, remember the context. They've just been bought and brought from slavery. So God didn't do that to put them back into slavery. The commands are to help the new free people steward their freedom well. To learn how to flourish with the uh, new freedom they now enjoy. These commands were not a burden. They were a blessing. Have no other gods before me. Honor your parents. Keep the Sabbath. And don't murder or steal or commit adultery or lie. But then you get to the end. And you have this last command that doesn't seem to be nearly as important as the first nine. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. What I want to do today is show you that instead of being a minor postscript, this command not to covet is as significant as the granddaddy of all commandments, to have no God before Yahweh. The first thing you need to know is there is nothing like the 10th commandment in any other ancient law code. And we found other law codes of ancient peoples, 
They had commands not to murder or not to steal. But nobody has a command not to covet. For one thing, how do you police coveting? Now, you, you might run into somebody's car and get a ticket. You might steal someone's car and get arrested. But no policeman is ever going to confront you because you coveted somebody's car. There's no ancient law code that has anything like this. But see, what's different is that the Ten Commandments aren't just a call to conform to some external code. They declare God's right to rule our internal thoughts and attitudes. God says, I have the right to be sovereign over what you're thinking about, not just what you're doing. You see, if the granddaddy, if the first commandment have no God besides the Lord God, if that one is the motivation for all the other commandments, then I'm going to suggest the tenth commandment is the explanation for why we fail to keep the other nine. Let me take you to a story in the Old Testament about King David and a woman named Bathsheba. Now, if you've never heard this story, King David is doing well. He's at the peak of his reign. His army's off fighting a battle. He's back at the palace. He goes out on the roof, and he spies a woman taking a bath on her roof. And he becomes consumed with lust. And he says to his servants, go get her. They bring her to him, and he takes her to bed. And then she finds out she's pregnant. So he calls her husband back in from the battlefield and gets him drunk so that he'll go sleep with his wife and everyone will think that the child is uh, his child. But her husband has too much on her. So David comes up with a plan to send him back to the battlefield with secret orders to get him killed or murdered. And the whole ugly thing has dire consequences on David, on his extended family, and on the whole Nation. Now, let's go back through. What happened? Well, he saw a woman and called for her, so he broke the uh, Eighth Commandment and took what wasn't his. And then he broke the Seventh Commandment, and he committed adultery. And now he's got a problem. He's got to try to cover it up, so he broke the Ninth Commandment and lied. And then he breaks the Sixth Commandment and orchestrates someone getting murdered. And the whole thing is taking God's name in vain, which is breaking the third commandment. And you could argue he broke the first commandment because he put his image and his lust before God. But the whole sordid affair began on the inside because he broke the tenth commandment and he coveted his neighbor's wife. David had the disease before he displayed the symptoms. This is why Jesus is saying, you better be on guard about coveting. My grandparents, my mother's parents, my nanny and my papa, they ran a wrecking yard. And if you were a grandson, it was paradise. It was eight acres of wrecked cars. And it had trees, big oak trees. And my favorite tree was so big you couldn't put your arms around it. And it was an awesome tree for climbing and for throwing footballs and rocks at. Well, one night, a storm comes through, a typical central Texas storm, not a big deal. And I get up the next morning, and that tree has fallen over. And I can understand. How could that storm have knocked that tree over? I go to investigate, and I get close, and that tree's hollowed out. And I realize that for years, that tree had been decaying on the inside from insects and from disease. And here's the point. Sin lies in the heart long before it shows up in the hand. This is why Jesus said, be on guard, because Jesus knows the 10th command is really just the first command in different language. Reject idolatry. Look at Colossians 3, put to death what is earthly within you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because the struggle for most of us is not to erase God, it is to replace God 
with something else that we are convinced that we have to have if we're going to have the life we want to have. The virus infects our thinking. And we conclude, I need something more than God to be a happy person. And the virus attacks all of us, even if very few of us are willing to admit that we've been exposed. Abraham Lincoln is walking down the street with his two sons, and they are fussing with each other. And he was asked, what's wrong with your boys? And he said, the same thing that's wrong with the whole world. I have three walnuts, and each boy wants two. Now, we may not confess the virus, but it's hard to conceal the symptoms. Let me ask you some questions to see whether or not you've been exposed lately. What do you think about most of the time? When your mind just wanders to something, is it to how thankful you are for all that you have? Or do you begin thinking about what you wish you had? How good are you at rejoicing with others? The Bible says, mourn with those who mourn. Rejoice with those who rejoice. When he gets the promotion that you wanted. When she gets the award you think you deserved. When you find out that they are pregnant again. And you haven't been able to get pregnant once. Do you rejoice with those who rejoice? Because if you've been exposed to the virus, that's hard to do. How do you make decisions? Where am I going to live? Am I going to take that new job? What am I going to do in my leisure time? Do you make those decisions based on what you want? Or through the filter of what is God's mission for my life? What's your first reaction when you find out the pastor is going to do a series on preaching, on money and on giving? See, these are all indications that we have been exposed. Here's what I want you to remember. God's commands are not so much rules about how to behave. They are guides for the kind of people he wants us to become. God's aim is to shape us into people of radical love. Jesus said you could sum up all of God's commands in two phrases. Love God and love people. That's the point. That's where God wants to take us. Listen to Paul. The commandments. You should not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not steal. You should not covet. Whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But here's what happens. The more virus creates distance between people. Because you are coming between me and more. Think about it. Why did Cain murder Abel? Because he was jealous of the approval Abel got that he didn't get. And why did Saul chase and try to kill David? Because he coveted the affection the people in the nation had for the young war. And King Ahab has all of Israel to rule. But he sees one little vineyard, and he kills Nadab to get it. And God said, that's it. Or think about maybe the greatest story ever told. Jesus said, a young son said to his dad, give me what comes my way. And he takes it and leaves and goes to another country, lives a wicked life, ruins his life, winds up at the rock bottom, says, I'm going to go home. And instead of being cast away, that dad sees him and runs after him and chases that boy and brings him home and throws a party. But his elder brother won't come. Why? He's angry. Who's paying for that party? He blew his inheritance. That should be mine. Why should he get more? See what it does to us? Listen to James. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. 
God wants to shape you into a person of radical love. But here's the thing. When it comes to relationships, they can never get better as long as you're bitter about what someone else has. The more virus causes us to love people less. And if you're not loving people well, you can't love God at all. I didn't write that. The Holy Spirit did. If you cannot love your brother that you can see, you cannot love a God you cannot see. That's why Charles Spurgeon said, I never knew a covetous man to be converted. Because really, it's not just that you can't love people well when you have the virus. You can't love God well. Because at the root of coveting or greed or whatever name you want to give it is this. A dissatisfaction with God's allotment of things. Now, you would never say this. But deep down, you resent the way God has distributed his creation. You should have got more. Nobody will admit this. But Jesus said you will commit this if you don't stay on guard. So, how do we inoculate ourselves from the more virus? I remember when I'm a young teenager not driving yet, I'm in the car with my mother. And we stop at a red light, and this big, long, sleek, brand new Cadillac sedan pulled up right next to us. And my mother looked over at that car, and she said, I wish I had that car, and he had a better one. And she turned and said, Because we're not supposed to covet. (laughs) Now that's a strategy. I don't think it's the best strategy. Let me suggest another that Paul gave to his young uh, intern, Timothy. He said, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing... We will be content with that. There is a cure for the virus. The cure is not to get more. The cure is to desire less. Let me put it simply and bluntly. The treatment is contentment. You can start rejoicing in what you have, or you can keep on resenting what you don't have. Now, which choice sounds more freeing, and which choice sounds more enslaving? The treatment is contentment, but here's the thing. Nobody drifts into contentment. It must be pursued. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4, I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. You're not born that way. Contentment is not inherited. Contentment is cultivated. You intend to become this kind of person that the virus cannot infect. Uh, Ed Youngs was a well-known pastor at Second Baptist in Houston for many years, but he started his ministry at a little rural Baptist church in North Carolina. And I heard him tell this story about a member that they called Brother Tommy. Now, Brother Tommy only finished the third grade. But he was everyone's favorite Bible teacher because he had spent all his life just reading God's Word. He had never been more than 50 miles from where he was born. So as an older man, the church took up some money to give him a gift five nights in New York City. So he went and he came back and Ed Young went, Brother Tommy, what do you think? Tell me about your trip. And he said, Pastor... My last night, I got down on my knees at my hotel, and I prayed, Lord, I thank you that I have not seen anything here that I want. How do you become a person the virus cannot infect? It's important because we are about to enter a season in which the virus is especially contagious. You've got to understand, I love the holidays. I love all of it. I love the lights. I love the food. I love the gifts, giving and receiving. I love all of it. But the virus is especially strong these next few weeks. We're going to go from getting about three to 4,000 messages a day to getting about 10 
thousand messages a day, and they all say, how can you possibly be happy until you have what you don't have yet? So, let me suggest a few things you need more than you need more things. Here's the first. Grow more grateful. Contentment is not the acquisition of everything you want. It's the realization of everything you have. And what I'm about to say is blunt, and I don't mean it to create guilt for anyone, but I just need to say, if you have food and clothes and a place tonight to lay your head so you won't get wet if it rains, if you have food, clothes, and a place to stay, you have more than Jesus did. So every few years to teach you this, I like to do what I call the it could be worse exercise. So we're going to do that together. And when I point to you, I want you to say it could be worse. Let's practice. You ready? One, two, three. It could be worse. Okay. So when church is over, you're going to walk toward a car. And now your car may not be brand new. It may have some dents and some chips in the paint. And you're going to walk past a car that is brand new and looks awesome. And the virus is going to attack. But you are going to say, it could be a lot worse. You have a car. Billions of people can't imagine such a privilege. You can get a job a long way from where you live because you have a car. If your babies get sick, you can get them to a hospital in minutes because you have a car. It could be a lot worse. And then you're going to go wherever you stay. Maybe it's your home, it's your apartment, uh, wherever you're renting. And you're going to drive past some neighborhoods where the houses are a lot nicer than your house. And the virus is going to attack. But you are going to say, it could be a lot worse. There are billions of people right now in this world that cannot imagine living where you could flip a switch and light comes on, where you could turn a knob and clean water comes out, even hot water. It could be a lot worse. And then, for those of you that are married, you're going to think about your spouse. (laughs) Let's be honest. He has lost some hair, and she has added some pounds. <laughs> but they have put up with you through all these years of good and bad times. So when you wake up in the morning, you are going to roll over, and you are going to look at your spouse, and you are going to say, <laughs> no, you're not going to say that. Are you crazy? You are going to think that. Listen to Paul. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Here's some, listen, church, Thanksgiving is not a destination. It is a determination. Thanksgiving is not, well, when I finally get there and have this, then I will know. It is a determination right here where I am. I'm going to be grateful for what God is doing in my life. Now, that's what Paul said, and that's how Paul lived. Remember in Acts 16, he gets thrown in prison unjustly and gets beaten beside. And he is not pacing in that cell. He is praising in that cell. So when he writes later to the Philippians and the the people that live in the city where this happened, and they know that it happened, his words carry weight when he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I'll say it again, rejoice Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Rejoice in the Lord always has no expiration date. So when you get exposed to the virus, you expose that virus to some worship. You get your worship on and you remember the goodness of God in your life. Get more grateful. Here's number two. Become more generous. One of the best inoculations against the more virus is not taking a vow of poverty. It's making a commitment to generosity. Paul has spent some time with the Ephesian church. He's about to leave. He's gotten very tight with the elders. So he has one last meeting with them. 
It's interesting to me, the very last thing of all the things he could have said, this is the last thing he chose to emphasize. Now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he set apart for himself. I've never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked so to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who were with me. And I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Of all the things he could have left them with, he chose that. Why? Because he remembered what Jesus said. Be on guard. Harvard University published a study they did about 15 years ago. And they asked the question, can money buy happiness? Now, I don't know what metrics they use to determine how happy you are. But here's what they concluded. It can buy happiness if you live in poverty. Getting enough money to get above the poverty line can make your life happier. But once you get there, getting your salary doubled does not make you noticeably happier. Unless you use your extra wealth to bless somebody else. Science magazine had the same finding. They took two control groups. They gave them the same amount of money. To the first group, they said, go buy something you want. And to the second group, they said, go give this money to help somebody. And it was the second group that measured higher rates of happiness. They determined it is more blessed to give than to receive. Have you heard that before? Generosity is good for you. Stony Brook University School of Medicine said that it reduces your blood pressure as much as medicine or exercise. New Republic magazines did a study and said generosity triggers chemicals like endorphins and dopamine and oxytocin that make you feel better. A study in U.S. News revealed that people that are generous have a 63% lower mortality rate. Oh, and by the way, that money you're carrying around, University of Louisville says 13% of your coins and 42% of your paper money have disease-producing organisms. Get rid of it. (laughs) I should have called this sermon, Be Generous, or you will die. (laughs) Here's the thing. Money can only add meaning to your life when it's not the meaning of your life. Isn't that what you felt last Sunday when you gave to Harvest? Do you regret a single penny you sacrificed to help other people in the world meet Jesus? Felt good. Ask the people that are fostering. They will tell you the hardest thing we've ever done, one of the best things we've ever done. Paul again writes his intern with advice for rich people in his church. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. You see, people that take hold of true life are thinking about more than this life. That's the last big idea. To pursue commitment, acquire more perspective. One of the richest men in America years ago was named J.D. Rockefeller. And when he passed away, a journalist asked his accountant, how much of his wealth did he leave behind? And the accountant said, all of it. And that's what's going to happen. You did not enter this world coveting anything. And you are not going to leave this world with anything that you coveted. So an eternal focus is a good vaccine against an internal virus. One of my preaching heroes passed away just a year or two ago. It was a man named Ben Merrill. Preached the gospel every Sunday into his 90s. He's in his 70s. He and Pat are in California on a busy street in Fullerton, and they're behind a pickup, and some look like table legs bounced out of the back. 
Pat says, Ben, pull over. He pulls over. Get out of the car. Go get all that stuff. I'll go chase them down and tell them they lost it. She takes off. Here's this 70-something-year-old man dodging cars, trying to pick up table legs, sweating, wearing himself out, exhausted, waiting and waiting for her to return. She finally does. He says, did you catch them? Yes. Are we taking this back to them? No, they were just hauling all that stuff to the dump. (laughs) We spend so much time and energy yearning for what will only wind up burning. See what I did there? It's true. We spend so much energy trying to find joy in stuff that our kids are just going to throw away. Jamie and I were blessed our very first year of marriage in a very unusual way. We bought this tiny little house. We didn't have much stuff in it, but we were happy. It was the first Sunday of the NFL football season. I was excited. We went to first service. I preached. She went home. She put a roast in the oven. We were going to come home after second service and watch our first Sunday of NFL football as a married couple. But when I got home, there were police cars in front of the house. And we'd been robbed. Learn later that it happens a lot. Pastors get robbed a lot on Sunday mornings. They didn't take too much because we didn't have too much. But they took our TV. They took some personal items and some appliances. And they, they took Jamie's jewelry, which was sad because it was from her grandmother. And I regret that it happened. But Jamie and I processed later and we realized if we're going to have a strong, good marriage, it cannot be built on things that somebody could steal. Or that depreciate or corrode or wind up getting hauled to a dump. Listen to me. You will never find lasting joy from things that won't last. I'm not saying God sent the robbery. I'm saying God taught us in the situation and we were better for it. Although... I think there needs to be a special place in hell for someone that would steal a pastor's TV on football season. (laughs) Amen? What we learned is that we need something more. Or maybe I should say we need someone more. So listen again to Jesus. The one sin we all confront The one sin we never confess. Be on guard. Watch out. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now think about Jesus' words almost every time I prepare a eulogy. I have preached hundreds of funerals. And not one time at a funeral do we talk about stuff. We tell stories. At funerals, we don't care who had the most. We talk about who did the most with what they had. And we often leave more thankful and more thoughtful about what we have. Because we realize at a funeral, if I have Jesus, I have more than enough. So church, enjoy the holidays. Eat and drink. Give and receive. But be on guard. Keep your focus on Jesus. Worship Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Ponder how much you have because you have Jesus. And if you will do this, Instead of wanting what other people have, other people will want what you have. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for being so honest 
about our condition. And help us to be more honest too. Even if we haven't confessed it, we've all been infected. We all deal with it. Give us the courage to deal with it more intentionally. And to choose to pursue contentment. Thank you, God, for all the good you have done in our lives. Give us eyes to see it and be grateful for it every day. Give us this season especially the opportunity to witness to the world that joy can't come from a mall and that Amazon can't bring it to your porch. The joy comes from knowing Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.